afternoon to everyone. Uh, we are going through a series of the uh, play elements, um, source, uh, hydrocarbon migration, reservoir trap and seal are the five main play elements. Uh, last session we talked about source and uh, today we'll talk about uh, trap and structural geology uh, since they're pretty related to each other. I showed this uh, last session when we talked about source rocks. Uh, for success, we need uh, four essential elements. We need a source rock, we need a reservoir quality rock, we need the ceiling lithology, and then we need, need overburden rocks uh, so that the uh, source and the reservoir gets uh, buried deeply enough. There's uh, two main processes. One is trap formation, which is what we'll focus in on today, and the other processes relate to hydrocarbon generation and then migration and finally, hydrocarbon accumulation. So this is an outline. There's uh, five points here. Uh, first, talk about the purposes of structural analysis in hydrocarbon exploration, development, and production. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the role of seismic interpretation in doing structural analyses, uh, the strengths and weaknesses of seismic data for structure, uh, I'll talk about a concept which is called structural styles and why that's important to uh, people in uh, the hydrocarbon uh, business. And then we'll talk about hydrocarbon traps. So structural analysis, uh, this is the grandiose apple pie motherhood statement. Uh, structural analysis is the analysis of all the significant processes that first formed a basin and then deformed its sedimentary fill and those processes can be from basin scale processes uh, such as plate tectonics down to centimeter scale processes such as fracturing uh, because uh, things like fracturing can either help hydrocarbons get out of the source rock or on the negative side they can allow hydrocarbons to leak out of traps. Some of the main elements that we look at in our structural analysis especially uh, using seismic is uh, basin formation. Uh, we want to map the fault networks. We want to consider how the structuring, faulting, folding has uh, deformed the stratigraphic layers. We're interested in present day trap definition and then when the traps formed. So the purposes of structural analysis, uh, the obvious answers, uh, we want to properly locate our wells. Uh, and that could be exploration wells or uh, field development wells or field production wells. Uh, we may want to be looking for new reserves and uh, we always want to efficiently produce the discovered reserves uh, that our company has uh, in their portfolio. But the uh, other things we want to do in terms of structural analysis, we want to define the size of the hydrocarbon reserves how many barrels of oil or how many uh, cubic feet of gas. We want to determine trap integrity. Uh, how good is the trap and what's the control? Uh, things such as uh, if there's a fault through the reservoir zone, uh, is that fault a ceiling fault or a leaking fault? And we also want to understand the basin architecture and that will help us as we develop ways to uh, model the uh, temperature history of the basin, which is a key factor in predicting source uh, hydrocarbon maturation, and also to model hydrocarbon migration. So in terms of seismic, uh, we can use the seismic in our structural analysis to try to identify and map faults, folds, uplifts, and other structural elements. We can interpret structural settings uh, such as is it an extensional basin, is it an impressional or collisional basin, is it a strike slip basin, and then we can also interpret structural styles and I'll talk more about and define what I mean by structural styles in a few minutes. We want to ensure that the 3D geometric uh, relationships that we're mapping are consistent, uh, that the uh, structural uh, uh, interpretation is valid. We may need to determine the timing of relationships, especially when did the trap form relative to when hydrocarbons were being generated and migrating. And we want to check if the interpretation is admissible. Uh, does it make sense if we undeform the uh, basin 
uh, and look at uh, its uh, history. The data that we use, um, we use a lot of seismic reflection data, either 2D seismic or 3D seismic. We can use seismic refraction data. We can use surface ge geological data, uh, information we get from field uh, mapping, and we also are able to use remote sensing. Uh, we may have some wells, and those wells may uh, intersect uh, several fault zones, and so we want to know where those faults are and uh, what uh, age is uh, above the fault and below the fault. Uh, gravity measurements can be helpful in determining uh, the structure in a basin, and also magnetic surveys. Uh, caution about seismic data. Uh, most seismic data is displayed in two-way travel time. How many seconds does it take for the energy to go down, hit an interface, and come back up to the uh, surface? So on the uh, seismic sample uh, line here I have, uh, 1.5 is uh, one and a half uh, seconds for the energy to get down and, and come back up. Here's two, two and a half, 2.75. So um, I would say these days, probably about 80% of uh, seismic interpreters work with uh, two-way travel time data. Some companies are more heavily involved in getting uh, depth seismic. Uh, other companies uh, maybe a little uh, less. One of the things we have to be consider take into consideration is what the vertical exaggeration is as we're looking at seismic either on our computer screen or on uh, paper sections if uh, we're uh, dealing with uh, with paper. We can set the computer screen up uh, with the scales uh, horizontal and vertical so that in our zone of interest perhaps uh, at this level it's a one-to-one -one vertical to horizontal, but because velocities tend to increase overall with depth, that vertical to horizontal ratio will not stay one-to-one -one as we go deeper, and also it will not stay one-to-one -one as we go shallower. So one of the things that um, uh, structural interpreters love to do is to display their sections with a one-to-one -one vertical to horizontal ratio, uh, and it takes a little getting used to uh, working with seismic data. Uh, I think on the seismic image shown here, uh, the vertical to horizontal ratio as displayed is more like um, uh, one to four or one to five. So this fault, uh, the red dashed line, uh, it appears to have a dip of about uh, 70 degrees. Uh, when you take out the vertical to horizontal ratio uh, exaggeration, uh, that's probably more on the order of 10 degrees. Uh, the strengths of seismic data in terms of doing structural analysis, uh, the first point is that inherently it's three-dimensional data, even if we only have a 2D grid of seismic lines. And I have a little ma uh, base map shown down here, a uh, hypothetical case with uh, uh, about uh, six 2D seismic lines. The little red hat hatches are uh, indicating where uh, an interpreter might see a fault cut. Uh, in this case, it would be down to the southeast. And with that information, uh, we might interpret there's a fault plane uh, position where the dotted red line is. So although we only sample it or see it, uh, on uh, selected 2D lines through the area by mapping the faults and correlating them and deciding which fault cuts relate to the other, we can then draw fault planes that are through going. And so the three-dimensional in nature. Another strength is we're able to image trap scale structures. So things that are big enough to hold an economic accumulation of oil or gas. We are able to image stratigraphy, and that can help us identify where we might have reservoir and seal, and it can be uh, useful in determining structural markers so that we can decide what sense of offset do we have on a particular fault and what's the magnitude of the offset. And I'll talk more about that uh, in a couple of minutes. And uh, we can also build a structural framework, and that gives us a three-dimensional context in which to understand other data that we have, our surface geologic data, well data, and potential field data. And potential field would be uh, gravity and magnetic data. 
The weakness of seismic data for structural analysis, uh, the biggest one is we are limited in our resolution. We can't resolve really small features, but again, in terms of uh, looking for uh, economic fields, uh, we're not interested in very uh, small anticlines or uh, other types of structural features. Uh, steep dips uh, greater than maybe uh, 20 degrees can be difficult to image. Uh, acquisition can be difficult in uh, certain areas, especially if we have a hard water bottom and we have trouble getting energy into the subsurface. Uh, the vertical axis is typically migrated to a travel time, not necessarily depth, unless your seismic data has been processed uh, such that the vertical scale is in feet or in meters. And as I mentioned, because velocity overall increases with depth, we're going to get distortions on what the uh, uh, vertical to horizontal ratios are. The display scales commonly are not one-to-one, uh, -one, and so the geometries are distorted. And typically, we can't see hydrocarbons directly. We look for evidence for where the various uh, play elements all seem to uh, be favorable, and that's uh, where we would drill our exploration wells. From seismic data, we can get such information as uh, areas of basin subsidence and basin uplift. We can uh, identify and map correlate faults, uh, know where they are present, and try to work out what their uh, geological history has been. The same thing with folds. We can look at things such as uh, flexural loading. We can look at salt or shale diapirs. We can look at the strike and dip of different uh, stradal units, uh, stradal packages. We can uh, figure out the burial history. Uh, in certain areas, we're able to work up the thermal history. Uh, I talked uh, last session on source rock about geohistory and thermal history. Uh, we can also use seismic data to help predict where we have overpressured zones. And we can use such seismic data to help us understand when a particular trap uh, or a particular structure grew. There is a synergistic relationship. Um, I contend that you cannot get all the structural information out of a uh, seismic uh, data set without working a little bit of stratigraphy. And uh, similarly, you can't get all the stratigraphic information without working some of the structure. So um, let me use the piece of seismic at the bottom of the slide as uh, an illustration. Uh, we have the light green fault that has been drawn in there. And then we have the cyan horizon that's at this position. And then it's down thrown to this position. We also have the purple horizon that's at this position. And then it's down thrown to this position. Now imagine there's no interpretation on the seismic for a moment, and I see enough disruption in this uh, central portion where different uh, reflectors, the uh, red, yellow, orange bands, or the black, gray bands are broken, that that gives me uh, clues that there uh, might be a fault um, uh, positioned in about the position where the green line is drawn. We uh, don't have fantastic seismic resolution here, so you could argue whether the green line should be a little steeper or a little gentler in slope, uh, but uh, most seismic interpreters seeing this line would uh, agree with me that yes, there's probably a fault going through there. Now, if my uh, supervisor came in and saw me drawing a green, uh, light green fault on my section, uh, she might say to me, Fred, uh, what kind of fault is that? Is that a normal fault or is that a reverse fault? And uh, I happen to know that this particular piece of seismic comes from the uh, Gippsland Basin in Australia. It's an extensional pull-apart type of a basin. And so I could tell my supervisor that I'm pretty confident, maybe 90%, that this is an extensional normal offset fault. And she might say, fine, I'll accept that. Uh, now, Fred, uh, what's the offset on that fault? Is it 10 meters or 100 meters or 200 meters or 500 meters? And without looking at stratigraphy at least a little bit, uh, I wouldn't know how to answer that. Uh, looking at it in a stratigraphic uh, manner, uh, 
let's say we drilled a well further to the right and we saw the top of our sand and we were able to correlate it and it one of the red orange reflection bands and since i'm a stratigrapher and maybe i don't worry too much about uh, structure i go along map the uh, uh, aqua horizon map it map it map it map it oh something crazy is going on but this is aqua 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 i drill a well over here and the reservoir comes in up at this level and not down here and obviously the problem is that i didn't realize there was a fault with a certain magnitude of offset. So one of the things that we can do, we can look for breaks in the reflections to indicate there's the presence of a fault. And then we can look for marker beds, uh, unique uh, elements of the seismic. And so as an example, I have this red, yellow, red here. Uh, this would be a trough if I was looking at a paper section and it would have a trough, a local minimum uh, or local maximum and another trough. And I get the same signature down here, red, yellow, red. And so I might say, I believe this unit up here, this doublet is uh, related to uh, the same, same age as this doublet. And so now I could say that the purple at the base of that doublet corresponds to the purple at the base of the doublet here and I can measure how many milliseconds of offset that is. And then if I have a interval velocity or I can get one from my seismic data processor, I can go back and tell my boss, yes, that's a normal offset fault. And it has a magnitude of uh, 420 uh, meters. So we can't, um, we can't get all the structural information out without worrying a little bit about stratigraphy, such as marker horizons. We can't get all the uh, stratigraphy out without understanding that our horizons uh, are going to be offset at uh, the various faults that we may be crossing as we are mapping our data. A little bit on uh, fault terminology. Uh, there's a white black here with the uh, uh, purple line on top of it. It correlates to this white black down here. The purple line would be my uh, mapping horizon. I have a zone where a fault has uh, cut through and offset the uh, reflections uh, uh, down thrown on the left side of the, of the green fault. Uh, we talk about the stratigraphic separation, which is going from the high side cutoff to the low side cutoff. And so the purple horizon is cut by the green fault on the high side here. It's cut on the low side here. The stratigraphic separation is the hypotenuse of the triangle. And what we usually talk about of um, uh, seismic interpretation is what the throw of the fault is, the vertical offset, and then what the heave is, the lateral or horizontal offset. So our stratigraphy can help us in our structural analysis. Uh, it can constrain the magnitude of displacement across the faults. We can figure out the throw, the heave, and the stratigraphic separation. And we can correlate across faults, and we can come up with some piercing points, uh, points on the high side and the low side that th we think at one time were uh, continuous uh, before the faulting caused the offset. Uh, we can define reservoir trap and source uh, intervals and geometries. Uh, given timing information about the deposition, uh, we can look for where we have a uniform thickness uh, across a fault and that we would expect uh, before the fault moved or after the fault moved and where we have variable thickness of an interval, um, a high side versus low side of the fault. And that tells me that there was uh, fault movement during the time when that particular unit was being deposited. I believe the next slide I'll, I'll illustrate this uh, a little bit more. We can also identify the location of detachment surfaces if we're talking about uh, thrust faults. And we're able to assess the capacity of uh, faults to either seal hydrocarbons or allow hydrocarbons to leak across them. Uh, so when we're mapping a a uh, faulted horizon, uh, maybe this is a map for the two-way time uh, of that uh, uh, purple horizon that I was looking at. Uh, the deeps are the blues, 
the highs are the hotter colors, the uh, reds and oranges. Uh, here is where the fault gap is, uh, where we go from a high side location to a low side. You can see from the color changes that I'm um, stepping down um, a certain number of milliseconds. It looks like uh, on the order of about uh, 50 milliseconds. And the uh, structural, or I'm sorry, the time contours here will be cut off by the fault uh, and there'll be a, a break in the contours as we go across the fault zone. Some of the uh, observations that we can make, we can of reflectors and so here is a piece of seismic and let me put on where the fault is and this white block comes along uh, right to left and it terminates uh, this black to white terminates this white to black terminates this white to black terminates this white terminates this white terminates so there's enough evidence uh, along this zone that I can uh, draw in a fault plane and again because of the uh, uh, limited resolution, uh, you could argue a little bit on uh, how steep or gentle uh, that would be. Uh, we can look for offsets in stratigraphic markers, such as the uh, doublet, the uh, uh, red, yellow, red that uh, I noted on an, an earlier piece of seismic. Uh, we can say maybe this black, white, black is this white, black, black, white, black, and uh, correlate uh, uh, what the uh, offset is. We can look for abrupt changes in dip. Uh, there aren't abrupt changes in dip across this particular fault, but uh, a lot of faults will have uh, one dip on the high side. It will have a different dip of the reflectors on the uh, opposite side. Uh, we can look for changes in seismic patterns. So this is a pretty continuous uh, set series of blacks and whites, and then it becomes less continuous. This is more continuous. This is less continuous. Uh, this is pretty high amplitude. This is pretty low amplitude. So we can look for evidence uh, across potential um, uh, fault zones uh, and uh, get more and more evidence as to what type of uh, fault and how it's positioned. Occasionally, we'll see reflections off the fault surfaces themselves, but typically the fault plane has to be less than about uh, 30, maybe 25 degrees in order for us to see the actual reflections. We can also see folding or sag above it. Uh, so here we see this uh, black uh, dipping down. I don't believe the fault goes much higher than where it's drawn, but because of differential compaction, uh, younger uh, units will, sh will possibly show some folding or some sag. And then we can look for discontinuities. I'll talk more about that and define it in the next couple of slides but that's where we quantify the change in uh, reflectance strength and, uh, and um, uh, continuity. So this is a uh, time slice out of a 3D seismic volume. It's from offshore Louisiana. It's at a reflection time of 1.856 seconds or 1856 milliseconds. On the slide, the blues would represent peaks on a black and white uh, paper section. The reds would be the troughs, and the whites between the reds and the blues would be zero crossings. And as you look at this, you can see evidence for where uh, there might be a fault offset. Uh, perhaps the easiest one to see is right through here, where we have a blue juxtaposed against a red, a red juxtaposed against a blue, a blue against a red, a red against a blue, and so on and so on. There's another one that sneaks through here. There's another one that sneaks through here. There's several uh, east-west uh, faults that cut through here. So we can look for disruptions in reflection patterns on time slices if we have 3D seismic as evidence for where faults are. Uh, Something that was developed in the uh, mid 80s was uh, coherency or discontinuity or variance. Uh, it is a, a derivative from a seismic reflection amplitude data set, and it uses a cross correlation method uh, doing a trace by trace correlation over a small time window. And if two traces, uh, a trace and its neighbor are perfectly identical,
uh, the cross correlation would be one. Uh, if it's uh, somewhat similar, it might be a 0.95. If it's uh, slightly similar, it might be a 0.9, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so we can do some um, processing of the reflection amplitude data, uh, such as shown on the left for 1856 milliseconds. And we can do the cross correlation and we can generate a new 3D volume that has X, Y, and let's say two-way travel time versus uh, uh, amplitude. We get X, uh, Y, two-way time, and the cross-correlation number. And so that is uh, what coherency is all about. That's a, a process that was patented by Amico in about 1985. And we usually use a grayscale when we're looking at time slices in the coherency cube. And the black means uh, a low uh, similarity. Uh, the cross correlation number might be uh, 0.85 or less. Where it's white or light gray, the cross correlation is probably uh, 0.9 or higher. And then we start to see some black lineations or gashes and those result because one trace might be on the high side of the fault and its neighbor is on the low side. And so there's very little uh, cross correlation of events at 1856 milliseconds. Or it might be that one trace is on the high side and the next trace, its neighbor, is within the fault zone. So uh, coherency is a, a relatively new um, type of uh, uh, seismic derived data uh, that structural geologists uh, tend to uh, really enjoy working with. We can also use a method of uh, co-rendering to combine the amplitude data with the coherency data. And that's what I show here. It's as if on my computer screen, I first drew on the uh, red, white, and blue reflection amplitude data, and then superimposed upon that the coherency data. But if the coherency is high, say uh, 0.85 or higher, it's uh, totally transparent. And then as the coherency number goes down, maybe to 0 0.7, uh, it goes into shades of uh, light gray to dark gray to black. And so now I see the black lineations indicating uh, significant changes in the cross correlation or the coherency. And where the cross correlation is high, the traces are similar, it's not likely that they're fault offset, I see the red, white, and blue amplitude data. So now I can interpret that there's a fault that goes through here, another fault that goes through here, another fault that goes through here, here's some of the east-west faults. And so by combining the amplitude data and the coherency data, the uh, very nice data set uh, in which to try to uh, identify, map, and correlate a series of faults uh, in a particular 3D survey area. When I'm doing my fault uh, identification, I can look at um, uh, north-south lines such as uh, segment AB, and I can look at where it intersects an east-west line such as BC. So here we go north to south. This is the intersection point. Now I'm going from west to east, and uh, the yellow would be a mapping horizon. The red is an interpreted fault. And let me get my pointer. And let's say initially I drew the fault as shown, but maybe I thought it went down like this. Then when I look at the east-west line where it intersects, my interpretation is that fault is up here. And so that's an inconsistency because I have one XY location, oops, and uh, I have two different uh, two-way time values, which is a proxy for depth values. So uh, that's not, uh, that's not uh, spatially consistent. So I have the option of, oops, get my pen back. I could either believe my north-south interpretation, oops, uh, apologize for that. Ah, that really messed me up. Get my pen. 
So if that is my interpretation, I could either reinterpret my east-west line so that they are consistent where the two lines tie, or maybe instead of uh, having this interpretation, I go back to this interpretation. So uh, making sure that fault planes also So on the base map, uh, A to B, uh, we're going from the high side to the low side. The gray, which is on my background color, is the uh, separation or the gap. And then this, this uh, uh, red fault uh, is also present on the east-west line over here. And so that red fault does something like that. When we're interpreting faults, uh, we'll do our uh, structural observations, and then we'll also keep in mind the structural concepts that we've learned. Let me get back to my pointer. Uh, in uh, Structural Geology 101 and Structure 201 and in Structure 418 and 522. So we talked somewhat about the structural observations, uh, terminations of reflectors, changes in dip. Uh, we can work on uh, the fault segments, how the fault planes are oriented, what's the sense of motion, normal or reverse or strike slip, what's the magnitude of the uh, offset, uh, and over what range of depths the, uh, the faults exist. And then we can keep in mind our structural concepts. Am I in a uh, extensional divergent pull apart type of a basin? Is it a convergent collisional basin? Is it a strike slip? Or in industry, we talk about wrench basins. Uh, do I have mobile, mobile strata such as uh, uh, salt or shale? And then there's various models for how several different types of structures evolve. Uh, there's a fault bend fold model. There's a fault propagation fold model. Uh, we've done a lot of exploration and work in uh, places with uh, salt bodies, such as the uh, Gulf of Mexico. And so there are various uh, models or theories as to how different salt features uh, evolve through time. Uh, that leads me to talk about structural styles. Uh, what is it? Uh, Harding and Lowell talked about this in a uh, book that they published in 1979. Uh, important differences in trend arrangements and structural morphologies provide criteria for differentiation of styles. These differences also result in different kinds of hydrocarbon traps. So let me uh, try to uh, uh, put some meat to this uh, definition. Uh, the structural styles you can think of as a two row by four column matrix. Uh, across the top, I have the type of uh, uh, tectonic process, uh, extension, contraction, lateral or strike slip, and uh, regional uplift or subsidence. And on the uh, two rows, I have basement involved, and that uh, is uh, short for basement involved faulting or basement detached faulting. So by Putting this matrix together, four by two, I end up with eight pigeonholes, such as extensional fault blocks uh, that uh, the fault offset basement or detached normal faulting where I have extensional faults, but uh, they do not go down to base. The reason this is important is because historically, we know uh, different types of traps have been discovered in each of these eight pigeonholes. And so there might be uh, overall 50 types of traps that uh, people have documented for uh, oil and gas fields. And um, my brain can't keep track of 50 different things to be looking for. But if I'm in an extensional basin and the faults offset basement, I'm in this pigeonhole, and this pigeonhole might have uh, six types of traps that are commonly found. And this pigeonhole might have five, and this one might have six, and this one might have four, and this one might have three, and so on and so on. And so if I understand my structural style, uh, then I can be on the lookout 
for four or five or six or seven different types of traps as opposed to trying to keep track of 50 possible trapping styles. A couple of uh, simple block diagrams and a seismic example. Uh, this is extensional faults where basement is involved. Uh, the red blocks uh, is meant to be, represent basement rocks. Uh, so I have three stratigraphic layers and then basement. Uh, these tend to be fairly steep uh, faults, uh, fairly uh, uniform in and go down uh, to uh, depth. Um, we can contrast that with extensional faults where the faults sole out within the sediment column or are detached from basement. Uh, again, basement is the red. Uh, this is an example from uh, Texas. I think it's onshore, but it could be offshore. Uh, this is uh, called the uh, Vicksburg flexure. Uh, if I get my pen back, if I were to continue to map this on seismic, it would come up and get shallower and shallower in terms of dip. Uh, we would get closer and closer to sea level and get my uh, pointer back. If I considered the red to green where the red arrow is, uh, these rocks were deposited way up here, uh, nearly horizontal and pretty close to the uh, shelf margin. And so they could have uh, some good uh, shallow water sands in it. As the uh, region was loaded with sediment, uh, this Vicksburg flexure is a glide plane or lift fault or slump fault. Uh, the sediments, the stratigraphy slipped down that uh, surface and are now located in this position. So I can have shallow water sands in a relatively deep water position. I have bending over or rolling over of the stratigraphy into the fault plane. Uh, this particular type of trap are called rollover structures uh, because of the way the reflections uh, appear to roll into the fault plane. And so if I am in an, uh, uh, a region where I have extensional basement detached faulting, rollover structures are one type of trap that I'd be, I would be uh, looking out for. Uh, for contractional, we can also have basement involved faults or basement detached faults. And uh, taken out of one of AAPG's um, uh, publications, uh, this is an example uh, published by Stone of uh, contractional faults uh, that are basement involved. Uh, Norton has published this one where they are uh, basement detached uh, compressional faults. Um, we tend to call these reverse faults. If they're high angle, we tend to call them thrust faults if they're uh, relatively low angle. Uh, diapirs, uh, salt diapirs, or shale diapirs are also uh, places where we often find traps. Uh, the purple blob in the center here is meant to represent a salt dome. We can see some extensional type normal faulting at the, uh, above the salt. Uh, dome top, and we can trap hydrocarbons associated with uh, that type of uh, collapse feature. Uh, we can also see uh, areas where the stratigraphy is uh, dipping up and into the salt. Salt has very low permeability and therefore forms an excellent seal, and we can get oil and gas trapped in porous reservoir quality uh, layers that uh, pinch out laterally. Uh, into the salt diapir. And the lower uh, left, we have a, a salt diapir that has uh, bent over, and the porous rocks underneath uh, terminate against that. One of the biggest uh, plays in the deep water Gulf of Mexico these days are to drill through salt overhangs or salt uh, canopies and look for oil and gas that is trapped underneath it. The uh, salt has anomalously high velocity that causes a lot of seismic imaging problem. And it's looking for traps like this below salt where people have to uh, convert seismic from uh, two-way time to depth. And uh, we also have to do a lot of uh, specialized processing. And typically people looking for these types of traps beneath uh, uh, salt are working with uh, pre-stacked depth migrated 
seismic. We also have uh, various models by which uh, different uh, features, uh, structures form. Uh, there's the fault bend fold model. Uh, this is an example uh, uh, sketch of uh, what we would expect uh, with a contractional uh, fault where the rocks above the detachment surface uh, have been shoved right, uh, left to right. Uh, and then this is an example where we have an extensional fault. These rocks have dropped down. Uh, there's uh, another model for ways uh, structures develop uh, that's called fault propagation folds. Uh, this is an example for contraction uh, where the rocks above the uh, detachment surface or decomant uh, shown in the red have moved right to left. Uh, and then this is an example for an extensional situation. The other thing we have to worry about is, is the interpretation admissible? Uh, does it violate any of the laws of nature? One thing that we can do is we can take a deformed section, and this is a present day representation of the stratigraphy uh, that was um, uh, interpreted on seismic data and uh, digitized, and that gives us different color layers. And then we progressively try to back out the uh, compression to look at the rocks prior to deformation. And what we're looking for are places where we have gaps. And I think right here we have a of stratigraphy. So gaps and overlaps tells me that uh, something isn't quite right in the interpretation. Uh, in this particular example, this is just a 2D representation. And so it could be an artifact that we're not looking at a pure structural strike orientation. But uh, be that as it may, I have a little bit of a gap here that tells me that the angle on this fault either is not correct or the way the stratigraphy above and below that uh, thrust fault uh, have been interpreted are um, uh, not perfectly correct. Uh, the real question is, am I going to drill a well here? And does that magnitude of the gap uh, going to change what I would expect in terms of uh, finding an economic amount of oil or gas? If that uh, inconsistency uh, indicated by the gap is such that it might change the um, volume of uh, oil or gas so that it would uh, no longer be economic, then I would want to correct the interpretation. But if it wouldn't change my business decision about drilling or where to locate wells, uh, then I would uh, just live with that uh, slight inconsistency. Some of the products that we get uh, uh, from our structural analysis, uh, coupled with our basic stratigraphy, we're able to define important geometric relationships. We're able to determine when faults were moving and when traps developed. We can predict the location of uh, detachment surfaces uh, in uh, compressional uh, faulted uh, regions, and we can evaluate the capacity of faults to seal hydrocarbons. Uh, this is what I was uh, referring to earlier. I said I would talk about how we can work on timing. Uh, here we have the orange, the I'll call it uh, purple, the pink, and the yellow layers. We have fault A, fault B, and fault C. And what we look at is the change in thickness, high side to low side. And orange, we see that the thickness thickens quite a bit, high side to low side. So the high side is a certain amount, the low side is uh, two and a half to three times that amount. That tells me that when the orange sediments were being deposited, that fault was moving. If I look at the uh, purple, uh, there's a little bit of a uh, thickening on the downside throat, so there was some minor fault movement. But the pink and the yellow, the thickness high side and low side are about the same, and so the fault had not yet started to move at yellow time or pink time. Similarly for fault B, the main fault movement is at uh, purple and pink time, uh, nothing at yellow and just a little bit at orange. And for fault C, the big fault movement is uh, yellow and pink time, uh, where I see big changes in yellow thickness, high side to low side, and pink thickness, high side to low side. So let me talk a little bit about hydrocarbon traps. Um, we can use depth or two-way time structure maps 
with our fault zones mapped to look at places where significant accumulations of hydrocarbons might be trapped. And we might have a purely structural trap, such as an anticline. Uh, we may have a purely stratigraphic trap, such as a subunconformity trap or a sand pinch out. Or we can have a combination trap that has a structural component or element and has a stratigraphic uh, element. So let's look at a couple of examples. Here we have an uh, anticline. Uh, this would be high. Uh, uh, profile A to A prime is shown on the right, A to A prime. Uh, we have, uh, I call it the camel structure here. We have two highs. That's uh, the uh, western one. That's the eastern one. And if this has been filled with hydrocarbons, uh, maybe it gets filled down to this point, which is the synclinal low, which is here. If I add more hydrocarbons, it will uh, leak or spill, I should say, uh, up to the northeast. And so one of the things we want to do with our structure maps is to consider how much fill might we have in uh, potential uh, uh, structural traps. If we have the same uh, geometry, but we have less hydrocarbon generated and migrated into this area, perhaps the fill now looks more like this, where we have the potential to trap more hydrocarbons, but we just didn't have enough uh, generated and migrated uh, into this region to fill them. Uh, one of the things that uh, has been documented is that our known fields, uh, I think it's about 90% of them are filled to some type of either a spill point or a leak point. So uh, historically, we do not find underfilled traps all that often. Uh, this is a rollover anticline type of a uh, trap. Uh, we have a Listric normal or slump fault. Uh, the reservoir quality unit uh, bends into the fault. If this fault uh, zone leaks and the hydrocarbons are able to escape, this would be the controlling factor, the leak point on the map, it would be this position. And so everything that is structurally higher than this uh, leak point would potentially hold hydrocarbons. However, if this fault is not leaking, but it's sealing so that hydrocarbons do not uh, escape up and to the right, then we may have a bigger accumulation of hydrocarbon. Maybe there's a synclinal spill point where if we add more hydrocarbon, it would leak off to the west. We can have stratigraphic traps. Uh, this is a subunconformity trap, uh, cross-section A, A prime. This is the map view, A to A prime. We have an upper sand and a lower sand, the upper sand and the lower sand. Uh, we have an unconformity that has uh, uh, truncated those sands. We have deposited a ceiling lithology on top of that. The units in between the sands in the older section are also uh, uh, ceiling rocks. And so we can have different fill levels. The uh, oil water contact in the upper sand is different from the one in the lower sand. We could also have a uh, reef uh, and uh, typically reefs are uh, porous and permeable near the fringes uh, where they're exposed to uh, wave energy. Uh, the lagoon in the center of the reef often is filled with fine grain material, is not reservoir quality. And so in cross section, we go B to B prime, B to B prime in map view. So that would be uh, a stratigraphic trap. And we can also have combination traps. Uh, this is an area of offshore West Africa. We have a structural high, A to A prime is this cross section. The uh, reservoir is uh, deep water channeled uh, uh, sands. Uh, the channel margin is uh, poor quality, sometimes uh, marginal reservoir, sometimes non-reservoir. The overbank shale is definitely not reservoir. And so we could have a case where um, the uh, uh, stratigraphy, the channel axis, defines where my reservoir is, and then the structure controls how much of that reservoir quality sand is filled. So in the cross section, the yellow would be the reservoir quality, the uh, tan would be the uh, le lower quality to non-reservoir uh, quality sands, and the grays would be the shales.
So in our structural analysis, we'll perform a structural styles analysis. What's the structural setting, extensional, contractional, strike slip? And what's the structural styles, uh, basement involved faulting or basement detached? And then what are the expected uh, faults, folds, and trapping geometries that I would have uh, given the particular structural style I'm dealing with? We construct a structural. We would um, uh, construct a structural interpretation, make sure, making sure it's uh, geometrically consistent in three dimensions. We can look at the kinematic and the mechanical um, uh, admissibility of the interpretation. We can then identify potential structural traps. Try to define the extent of the trap, uh, figuring out what controls the hydrocarbon fill level. Is there a spill point or a leak point? And we can analyze the timing of trap development. Uh, how did the trap volume uh, change as a function of geological time? And we would compare that trap size and its timing to the timing of hydrocarbon generation and hydrocarbon migration. So uh, a couple of references to uh, some of the illustrations on the uh, foregoing slides. And that concludes my prepared marks for structure and traps. Uh, I'll remind you there's no webinars uh, next week, uh, both uh, Tuesday and Thursday. I am going to not be available. And so we'll pick up in August. Uh, we'll talk about uh, seals and hydrocarbon migration and then move into seismic interpretation and uh, some of the other uh, topics that are listed here. So with that, I'll turn it back to our lovely hostess, uh, Danielle, and see if there are some questions. Great, thank you. Um, there is a question. How is the fault seal capacity identified from seismic? Uh, fault seal capacity is something that is important for us to try to figure out, um, but it is uh, an area of uh, continued research. One of the common things that are done is to look at the stratigraphy on the high side of the fault and the low side of the fault and consider what got uh, smashed against what as we went from a, a pre-faulting um, situation to the present amount of fault offset. And so uh, in particular, they look at how much uh, shale uh, could have been smeared in that fault zone uh, versus uh, more uh, porous uh, sands and, uh, and uh, uh, gravels and conglomerates. And if the uh, fault gouge has a certain uh, anticipated shale percentage, uh, if it exceeds some critical threshold and each company has a, a different threshold value they use, uh, then they'll say that this, the fault is uh, most likely to be sealing. Uh, if we have the luxury of having some type of a hydrocarbon indicator, like a strong amplitude, sometimes the um, amplitude maps will show us how far uh, down structure the trap is filled, and then we can try to reverse engineer, well, what would control the hydrocarbon being filled to that level? Is there some sort of a leak point that we can see? Is there a synclinal spill point? Or could there be uh, small offset faults uh, not easily detected by seismic that could be controlling the level of hydrocarbon fill? Great, thank you. So um, there's a couple of follow-up questions. Is there a probability that the structure shape changes after converting the seismic to depth domain? Um, basically, how reliable is the structural interpretation from two-way uh, time seismic? Yes, the, uh, the structure shape will certainly change uh, as we go from two-way time values to uh, depth uh, values, feet or meters, if the overlying stratigraphy has lateral velocity uh, changes. Um, what is often done is that the interpretation will be done on two-way time sections. Uh, that would give us a two-way time structure map. And then they will use a velocity model of either uh, moderate to very sophisticated uh, 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 details, precision, uh, in order to convert the time structure to a depth structure. So we don't necessarily have to convert all the seismic wiggles from time to depth. 
but it is a standard process standard um, uh, process uh, for uh, time structure maps to be converted to depth structure maps uh, at least when we're talking about where should we drill a well great um, is there any special reason for marking troughs in the middle and peaks on the top of the reflector as in slide 12 um, let me oh, let me go to 12. The, uh, the quick answer is is no uh, slide 12. Um, this goes back to a uh, discussion we had a couple of sessions ago about the uh, uh, phase of the data zero phase or minimum phase and um, uh, and uh, the uh, mapping convention that uh, a company would have. On this slide, the aqua horizon is in the center of a red, which would be a trough, and the purple is on a zero crossing. Uh, this was just uh, for illustrative purposes. Uh, typically, people would show their horizons as uh, either being in extreme positives and negatives on the peaks or on the troughs, or else they would be on the zero crossings. Uh, if it's zero phase data, we tend to mark peaks and troughs. If it's minimum phase data or relative impedance data, we tend to mark the zero crossings. So it wasn't uh, intended by me uh, to say these are our mapping horizons. They were more um, to um, uh, identify some uh, character of the reflections, like this strong red and this strong red, the base of this uh, red, yellow, red, in the base of this red, this red, yellow, red. So uh, a good uh, spot by uh, one of the people in the audience. Great. So that was Norman Zevin. He has another question. Could you please explain the difference between fault propagation and uh, fault bend fault? Uh, those are different um, uh, ways in which um, uh, we explain some of the structures that we see. Um, I'm not a structural geologist uh, uh, strong enough to uh, explain under which situ situations uh, we would expect the fault uh, prop fold style of uh, uh, deformation and when we would expect the fault bend uh, style of definite, uh, deformation. Uh, I do know that uh, as we work in different compressional areas, we see uh, evidence uh, that lines up with either one or the other. And I believe both of the models, if you track the history back far enough, uh, I think they come out of academia as opposed to uh, 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 oil and gas uh, industry folks. Uh, although I'm, I'm, I would imagine that uh, oil uh, uh, structural interpreters the hydrocarbon structural interpreters um, have, uh, had, had, had made those types of observations uh, as well. Great. And that, uh, that's all of our questions. So um, and that's we're out of time as well. Yeah. <laughs> so um, thanks again, Fred, for um, this lesson nine. We're we're getting up there double digits in two weeks time. So um, the next time we'll meet will be, um, what is it, August 1st? Is that August 1st, I believe, yes. Yeah, okay, great, sounds good. Okay. So we'll see everyone. Thanks for time. everyone tuning in and, and for your uh, challenging questions. Yes, all right, goodbye everyone. Have a great rest of your day. Okay. Bye. Bye-bye.